Okay, so uh, let's start for today. Now, if you remember, on Thursday we were we had almost finished discussing the Gauss law. The Gauss law, if I may repeat, it just states that if you have any closed surface in a region of space where there, there is an arbitrary charge distribution, and the integral of the electric field over this closed surface is always equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon zero. Of course, the charges outside will change the electric field, whether there are charges outside or not, but the charges outside just do not contribute to, the, to this integral. And we had, applied, we had done various applications of it. We looked at a point charge. We looked at the point charge for which we had assumed a, a spherical Gaussian surface. And now we had an extended charge sphere, a, uni a charge sphere, uniform or non-uniformly charged. Again, the Gauss surface was a sphere, either outside, if you are looking for the electric field outside or inside. And in both cases, we said that the electric field can only depend on the radial distance, and it can only be radially outward. And now we looked at some other ex another example where we had an infinitely long wire. In this case, we also said that the, first we looked at the electric field, and the electric field at a given point can only depend on the distance from the wire, and it was pointing away from the wire, or towards the wire. It was perpendicular to the wire. And then we said that, okay, if we know this about the electric field, then we can choose such a cylindrical surface, Gaussian surface, We can use such a cylindrical Gaussian surface to obtain the electric field. And in the previous cases, well, in this case, the, electric, the magnitude turned out to be just the linear charge density divided by 2 pi r, 1 over epsilon 0. And then we looked at an infinite plane. In this case, we said that the electric field can only depend on the distance from the plane, and it has to be in the vertical direction. And it turned out that in this case, the uh, electric field, if you just look at it from the side, the electric field lines are perpendicular to the plane, and if the plane is positively charged, it's pointing away, and they are uniformly distributed. And the electric field magnitude is just sigma over epsilon zero. Now, do you have any questions on these? Is it the applicability of the Gauss law? Uh, well, if you want to, well, there are various uses of Gauss law. Now, in these questions, what we were looking for is we were trying to drive the electric field knowing the Gauss law. If we know the Gauss law, how can we calculate the electric field? And in these cases, uh, we could calculate the electric field only for special cases for which uh, we could determine some surface over which we could evaluate the electric field. And it's only these cases. There are no other n cases that I know where you can actually use the Gauss law to calculate the electric field explicitly. The problem has to have sufficient symmetry so that you have to know something about the electric field beforehand. In this problem, we had to know that the electric field, the magnitude depends only on the distance from the center. It's in the radial direction. And in the, in the infinite wire problem, we had to know that the electric field depends only on the distance from the wire. And it's again pointing uh, perpendicular to the wire itself. And again, in this, uh, in this case, the, we had to first determine that the electric field depends only on the distance from the plane. and it's vertical to the plate. Without that knowledge before applying the Gauss law, Gauss law is still valid, but it's just useless in order to obtain the electric field. It has other uses. For example, on Thursday, we had looked at another problem where we knew the electric field in advance, and we were asked to find the charge inside a given volume. In that case, we can still use the Gauss law. Now, any other questions? 
An application of this result is, let's say, let, let's call it an application. <coughs> let us imagine that we have an arbitrary conductor. This is a conductor. We can put it in an electric field. Let's say the electric field is such that it looks something like this. We, we know, we had already discussed that on the surface of the conductor, the electric field has to be perpendicular to the conductor. This might be the electric field in the region close to the conductor. Then we can ask the question. Okay, in this case, since there are electric field lines leaving this region, we know that there are positive charges in that region. This region is positively charged. This region is negatively charged. Since there are electric field lines terminating in this region, they have to be negatively charged. Then we can ask the question. If we know the electric field, somehow somebody told us, oh, there you have this conductor, and in the near vicinity of the conductor, the electric field is given by this. How can we determine the surface charge density? Again, to determine the surface charge density, we can essentially use the Gauss law. So what we do is, let's just take, imagine we have a very small region over here. I'm just imagining a very small region. That region, if I just enlarge it, it will look like this. This is how that region will look like. Well, it is slightly bent. This is what it will look like. Well, let me take even a smaller region over there. If I now enlarge it, that region will look like this. I know that here there is the conductor. What is the electric field inside the conductor? It is zero. The electric field on the surface of the conductor has to be perpendicular to the surface. So whatever the charge distribution is, the electric field always starts perpendicular, and then it can go in some various directions. But at the end of the day, very close to the sur surface, it is always perpendicular. So now let me imagine such a surface, just like, you see, now it's very close to the conductor, it just looks like the infinite plane. You see, in the infinite plane, the electric field lines were perpendicular, they were uniform. And, well, the differences are, in this case, this is also flat. All of the electric field lines are perpendicular. Uh, well, the, here it's a conductor, so on one side the electric field is actually zero. The electric field lines, in this case, they bend. The electric field is not uniform. But nevertheless, if you look at a very small region, let me look, consider this region over here. Well, in that region, the electric field lines are always parallel to each other. Well, just imagine this to be even smaller. They are always par uh, parallel to each other. They are perpendicular to the surface. And if I imagine this area to be small enough, the electric field within that area will be uniform. So here I have the area A. So within the volume, it is parallel to each other. and is uniform. 
essentially I'm imagining such a small volume that basically the electric field in that volume doesn't change. That's why I can say that within that volume the electric field is uniform. And they are always perpendicular to the surface. Because I'm just imagining this cylinder to be, its height to be so small, it is so small that the electric field lines leave the surface perpendicularly and they didn't have enough time to bend yet. So they, are, they will be perpendicular and hence they will be parallel to each other. But now I can use the Gauss law, which states that e dot ds, just like in the case of the infinite plane, this will be e dot ds, e dot da, sorry, on the top, plus e dot da on the bottom, plus e dot da on the sides. Now, on the sides of this surface, the area vector, the a vector is horizontal, whereas the electric field vector is vertical. They are orthogonal to each other, so this is zero, just like in the case of the infinite plane. On the bottom, this area over here, well, the electric field is zero. The electric field is zero, so whatever the a is, this is zero. This is a difference from the infinite plane case. If you remember, in the infinite plane case, this integral and this integral, they contributed the same. What is left is just this segment over here. Well, dA for the top segment is pointing upward. Electric field is pointing upward. So the angle between these two vectors is zero. So this is equal to e dot, no, let the product of the magnitudes times cosine of zero, which is one. Well, the electric field within that area is, zero, is constant. So I can take it out of the integral. So I am left with e times a. If you compare it with what we had done on Thursday, in that case, we had the same contribution from this one. So this one contributed e times a. This one contributed e times a. So we had two of them. But here, from the bottom, there is no contribution because from the bottom is inside the conductor where the electric field is zero. So that is why we have only one a in this case. And this has to be the enclosed charge over epsilon zero. The if we call sigma the charge per unit area, well, just multiply that with the total area, you get the total charge inside. Now, keep in mind that this E is the electric field at the top surface. And that top surface is very close to the surface of my conductor. So essentially, this E is the electric field on the surface of my conductor. So basically, if you know the electric field on the surface of the conductor, then you know how much charge is accumulated on the surface. You know the surface charge density. If somehow you can determine the surface charge density of the conductor, you might devise an experiment and measure the surface charge density, then you know the electric field. Now, any last questions on Gauss law? You see, if you look at the bottom, 
It's inside the conductor, so it's zero. Well, the bottom doesn't have to be a plane. It can be any shape, in fact. The side. What is the direction of dA on the side? dA is horizontal. Oh, yeah. dA is perpendicular to the surface. This is the direction of dA. <coughs> well, depending on where you are, it can be pointing anywhere, but it has to be horizontal. Electric field is vertical. So the angle between them is 90 degrees. So their scalar product is zero. Well, you see, what we had done about, said about the conductors, inside the conductor, there cannot be any charge. So if you put it in an electric field, what happens is the charges move around, and they go to the surface. On the surface of the conductor, we can get charges. So here, sigma charge density per area, or charge per area, on the surface of the conductor. You are right. Inside, we cannot have any charge. But on the surface, we can. So we can define such a quantity. Basically, just take some area, calculate the total charge in that area, Divide by the area itself. That gives you sigma. Other questions? Now, let us refresh your memory about your mechanics course. What did you learn in the mechanics course? Do you remember the order of the things you learned? Already forgotten? Conservation of, Conservation of energy. But you, have, you should have learned something else before that. Hmm? Potential. You have learned the potential energy. And before that? Before that? Newton's laws, so you learned about the forces, right? So here in this course, what we had learned, we, we started with the point charges, forces. Then from the forces, we defined the electric fields. Well, in, the, uh, in your mechanics courses, you started from the forces, and then you defined the potential energy. Well, now we have a force. The first question is, is it a conservative force or not? Yes. How do you know? There is no, uh, how can I say? There is no loss. How do you know? Well, I will kind of cheat. You have studied gravitational force last semester, right? Well, electromagnetic force is basically, at least mathematically speaking, it's identical. Physical interpretation is different, but mathematically speaking, it's identical. So since you have already discussed that the gravitational force is conservative, so is the electric force. So we can define a potential energy. Do you remember how you define the potential energy given the force? Well, I cannot generalize it to the electric force. There is no G here. Negative of the work done. Negative of the work done. F minus F dot DL. This is the, well, the work done is, what is this? For a constant force, the 
the work done was defined by the force times its displacement. Delta L is the displacement. And F is the constant force. Well, if F was not constant, what we did, what you did was the usual trick we do in uh, physics. You just divide the path into very small segments. Within each one of those very small segments, you assume that the, well, let's say you have a particle that starts from point A to point B. If the force is not constant, you divide it into very small segments. Look at an arbitrary segment. It has a direction, let's say you, you start from A to B. So this is the DL for that segment. Within that segment, force is constant, almost constant. So you can use this expression, and then you just sum up all the expressions. And you get the in integral. Why do you define the potential energy as minus the work done? Well, the potential difference, let's say, to be more precise, the difference in the potential energy was defined as from A to B minus F dot DL. So what is this F? We said that it's the work done, but work done by whom? By the force. Whatever is creating, exerting that force. So if it is the gravity, if we just lift this up, the potential energy change is defined as minus the work done by the gravitational force as you are lifting this up. But you see minus F, what is this minus F? Minus F is the force exerted by the gravitational attraction on, of Earth. So what is minus F as I move this thing upward? No, not the magnitude, the, the physical meaning. Remember Newton's third law? Hmm? What is against the gravitation? Yeah, basically, my hand is exerting a force minus F. So I am doing the work on the system, and the work that I have done is being stored as the potential energy of the system. So that's why we actually have that minus sign. F is the force exerted by whatever the source of the force is. If you do some work against that conservative force, you are doing some work, and that work is stored in the potential, as a potential energy of the system. OK, this, is, this was just a review of your mechanics. Well, here we have a force. We have a conservative force. So now we can ask the question, what is the, let's say, suppose I have a charge over here. Let me call it large Q. And then I have another charge over here, small Q. What is the potential energy of this system? how we can calculate it. Let's say that they are separated by a distance r. Well, we can still directly use the definition of the potential energy. First, 
Well, the potential energy of the system will be how much work should I do to create this system? Well, how do I create such a system? First, I bring one of the charges from infinity. Let's say that this large Q charge, I, I bring them that charge from somewhere. Is there a work that I have done to bring it at that point? How much work? How much force do I need to exert on this capital Q to bring it to that point without the small Q? Sine theta r Okay. <laughs> well, there's no gravity here. Okay, so M, hmm? M sine theta R. M sine theta R. What is theta? Theta, I, I draw some horizontal line. Why horizontal? Because. What do you mean by horizontal, by the way? This is an empty space. There is nothing else. Just these two charges. And for, I say that initially, in fact, I don't even have the charges. First, I take this capital charge Q and bring it to this point over here. Which one? Assume that there are some charge, infinite charges isolated charges at infinity, not influencing each other, I just bring it to here. How much work do I have to do? Zero. There is no force acting on, on these charges yet. So there is no MR sine theta. So the first step, what I do, bring charge capital Q from infinity, from somewhere. Work done. is zero. Nothing exerts the force on that charge Q. Now, the second thing, bring small Q at a distance R. Now, first of all, being a conservative force, it doesn't really matter how I bring the charge small Q. I can, let's say there is the plus Q over here, capital Q over here. The small Q will eventually come to that point. I can bring the charge along such a path, and eventually it will reach here. Well, it will be a tough computation, but I would rather bring the charge there along this line. Whether I bring it along such a line or from that line, it doesn't really make any difference because it's a conservative force. So how much work do I need to do to bring this plus Q charge from infinity up to here? Now that's the question. Well, let's see. The force is constantly changing, so we just divide it into very small segments. This is my DL. I just take one of the segments. Well, that DL is, let's just call it DL in the radial direction. It is pointing away from this capital Q charge. Well, the force at that point will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, small q capital Q over R squared, Again, it will be in the radial direction. Well, I don't need to worry whether these are of the same charge or of the opposite charge, because that, that thing is taken already care by this factor over there. If this product is negative, that is, they, are, they have the opposite signs, then the force will be pointing in the minus r direction. If this product is positive, that is, they have the same charge, then the force will be 
pointing in the plus r hat direction. Now I just write f dot dl. This is the work that, I, that uh, this force does as the charge moves from this point to this point. And that will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, small q capital Q over r squared times dl times r hat dot r hat, which is 1. Well, the potential energy, this was minus f dot dl. So this is minus one over four pi epsilon zero, small q capital Q over r squared times dl. Now, how do I relate dl with dr? You see, if you look at this integral, these are just constants. But r is changing. As I go from one segment to the other segment, r will be changing. Now, I will be denoting the changes in r by dr, which, by the way, is defined as positive. That's the definition. Or, I mean, let me just leave it. Well, you see, as I go from this segment to this segment, along this radial line, I have moved the distance dl. But that means the radial distance has changed by dl. So dl and the L is nothing but the change in the radial distance. But keep in mind, let's go back. This is the direction of the DL vector. I define the DL vector as this number multiplied by the radial vector, pointing in the opposite direction. So this equality tells me that this DL is negative. So here, this dr that I define is something less than 0. It will be important in a moment. So u is minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q capital Q divided by r squared times dr. Now, what are the limits of my integral? What values do r take as I go from some point at infinity to this point? Well, you see, I'm here, and I come to this point. r is the distance from this point. So r never becomes 0. 0 is this point. The smallest distance of r is whatever this length is. Let me call that capital R. The smallest value that this small r can have is capital R as I go along this line. So what are the possible values of r? So the limit of integration should cover all those values. From infinity to r. Why not from r to infinity? Well, you see, I could have defined dr to be positive by putting a minus sign over here. The important thing is, what is the sign, the sign of this one? In this problem, we had chosen that sign to be negative. So it starts from a large value, goes to the smaller value. I could have just as well chosen this to be minus dr. In that case, dr would be positive, so I should t put the integrals from, small r, from capital R to infinity. The important thing is that my range should cover all my segments. 
Okay, so let's take that integral now. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q capital Q over R, when R goes, starts from 0 up to inf uh, starts from uh, infinity up to capital R. So this is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q times capital Q over R. Let me make one correction. This is not U. This is the change in the potential. The change in the potential is minus the work done by the force. So the change in the potential is the potential when their distance is given by the, this capital R minus the initial potential energy is when their distance is infinite. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, small q, capital Q over R. And it is conventional most of the time to set u infinity is equal to 0. This is a choice. So u of R, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, small q, capital Q over R. Yes, question. Well, depends on how, how you define dr. Do you define it to be a positive number or a negative number? It's up to you. But the only thing you have to pay attention to is that you have to be consistent. What we had done is I define my the displacement vector as I go from this point to this point as dl in the r hat direction. So in this definition, I already set this number to be negative. This is a negative number. Then the, the question was, how do I relate this number to change in the radial distance? You can choose, well, de definitely the L is the change in the radial distance. But you can define that change to be a positive or a negative thing. At this, in this case, I just set them equal so that dr is a negative number. Since dr is a negative number, when I am determining the limits, I had to make sure that the, the first limit, the lower limit, is larger than the upper limit, the last limit, because I am reducing the r when I'm carrying these integrals. That is why I didn't set from r to infinity, but rather from infinity to r. As long as you are consistent with your conventions, it doesn't make any difference. You see, when your integration is basically a summation, but when you are doing a summation, well, the order doesn't really matter. You, you can sum the first term, second term, third term, or you can f take the third term, add the first, second term, and add the first term. It doesn't really matter. But in integral, it matters which direction you go. So that's why when you are converting this summation to integral, you have to be consistent with your, in your conventions. Other questions? Well, just to emphasize, u of r is the potential energy. It's an energy, just like gravitational potential energy. This is the potential energy due to the electric force. It is important to know that this is the energy and to distinguish it from what we will call the potential. This is different from potential energy.
Well, how did we define the electric field? Force uh, acting on a unit charge by a given charge distribution. So if you have a charge distribution, we imagine bringing some test charge at a given point, and then that test charge felt some force. And we said that, OK, that we measured that force divided by the charge, and that was the electric field. Well, we will define a similar thing over here. When we bring this charge, well, let's go back to this problem. When you bring this Q charge at this point, the system has a total potential energy. So we will define the potential as something created by the other charges, by the way. It doesn't have to be a single charge, but you might have a system of charges over here. Now, when you bring this charge Q, you have to do some work. And that work is that work per unit charge Q is what we call the potential of the system. Potential not of the system of that point. Let's say you have some arbitrary charge distribution. And then you can ask the question, what is the energy, what is the work that you have to do to bring a test charge? To, a, to the position R. Well, the answer is the work done is minus F dot DL. You bring up, up to the point R, whatever, wherever that point is. Usually, you bring it from infinity. This is, you say F is the force that these charges will be acting on my point charge. This is how we define the, pot the change difference in the potential. It is per unit charge. This is the potential at the point R minus the potential at infinity. Again, the convention is the potential at infinity is zero. So that the potential at the point R is defined as, well, what is the force per charge? The electric field it's minus E dot DL. Just like the electric field is the force per unit charge, the potential at a given point is the uh, work done per unit charge to bring that unit charge from infinity to that point. And the unit. What is the unit of potential? It is defined as called volt. In terms of other units that are more familiar, well, it is the work done per charge. What is the unit of work? Joules, so is joules per coulomb. 
So one volt is one joule per coulomb. Now we had already calculated the potential created by a point charge. Well, this is what we said. This is the work that should be done So the potential of a point charge well this is the how much work we have to do to bring this charge q from infinity to a distance r so the potential was just the work done per unit charge 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q over r. Just make sure that you distinguish potential energy versus potential. They are different things. Potential is something like the potential energy per unit charge. Not exactly, but it's quite related. The potential energy is a property of the system. Whereas the potential is a property of the point. So if you have a charge distribution over here, let's say, the potential created at this point will be different than the potential created at this point, than the potential created at this point. At every point, the potential will be different. But if you have a given system, well, the potential energy is determined by all the charges making the system only. And it's, just, it's not associated with this point or that point. It's a property of the system. Okay, see you on Thursday.